You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. I'm Jared Mounts. Good to see you, Tom. Good it's to been see a little you. while. It's been a long time. Since I've been on. And we got yeah. a cool guest. And just before we bring him in, I just want to know about that like five second rundown of that tournament that you had on the chick. Oh, so yeah, it was uh it was a tough. It was a grind two days. Um it, it was a grind to say the least. We caught fish. Uh we finished probably about tenth out of twenty-three uh day one. Uh, it was one of those where you got a lot of good sticks out there and you know Day one, uh, a lot of boats blanked, no fish, Mm -hmm. or they caught one fish. Turn around the second day, they catch, you know, one fish. Uh, You know, obviously, there's always those boats that find find the fish, but um, but it's still good to be out, you know, on the Chickahominy, which is a great resource, uh, great fishery. Um, But it was definitely a grind for for all all anglers. So. but it was good. It was good. It's always good to be on on that that watershed. It, it really is. Like, and the, and, the, and the James is such a unique fishery, you know. And we'll be having more content about that, guys, as the year goes on. And I just want to say another huge shout out to um, really making the the John Mulliken the the most downloaded podcast episode that we have right now on Apple. And what's just again, like we were saying before the show, it's always a miracle that I could have Michael Iaconelli on here. But you get a scientist on in the region because we are a local show and we care about these waters. And we'll have a scientist on talking for two hours. And it says the retention rate is like an hour. Like people aren't turning it off. They're listening to every single word. And it's so funny because when I started this, people thought like, no one's going to want to watch that. It's boring as hell. <clears throat> no, because if you're a hunter or a fisherman, you care about the people that manage you know, our local waterways. And so it's not boring. And people do want to know about how they can help, uh, You know, whether it's about like reporting things that they see out on the water, fish kills, which you know, again, we're going to be getting into with our, with our guest here. But again, thank you guys so much. Please leave reviews. Please keep spreading the word of mouth so we can keep growing and having better guests on the show, more and better guests. Um, but then like, why don't we bring, bring this guy in? Yeah, so Mark Frondorf, uh, got the good fortune of meeting him. Uh, I think it was back around 2015 when he first started. We were talking before we came on air here. Um, we did, you know, we've done different seminars, you know, in the off season in the winter time. And, uh, he came in with Brad Fink and, and, uh, uh, we did it up, up the road there at the fairgrounds, uh, had a good turnout and, um, and that's where we first met him. And that's one of the great things about working, you know, at, at Jake's bait and tackle and just in the industry, how many great people are out mm-hmm. there. Um, and we're all anglers. Uh, it's one thing we talked about too, with these biologists and scientists, people often forget that, even though they're working for the state, they also enjoy the resource. They enjoy fishing. And so they're trying to do things that are in the best interest of the fishery. And we often forget that. Uh, but Mark, he was uh, president of the Potomac River Smallmouth Club at one point, yep. um, was a, a guide on the Shenandoah and still is a guide on the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers. Uh, and I believe he followed Jeff uh, Kelbley with, uh, when he moved up to the Potomac River Keeper, uh, moved into the D.C. area. Um, or that market uh, overseeing the whole watershed. Mm-hmm. I believe that's when you stepped in and, and filled his void mm-hmm. um, and going on eight years now as the Shenandoah River Keeper. So we're going to give him a chance to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about himself. And I would I would suspect a lot of viewers out there, listeners, uh, probably don't, don't even know that a river keeper exists. So we'll let you educate us about what sure. your job is and responsibilities here in the Shando Valley. Yeah, uh, that's great. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I moved into the DC area and back in the mid eighties to go to grad school. And I had about, I don't know, maybe seven, 10 days before school started in earnest. And I had heard a lot about the Shenandoah and I had never fished it before. And, um, so I threw my canoe on top of my car and headed out to um, Bentonville Low Water Bridge Campground and uh, got out there on a Friday afternoon and fished Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And it's, you know, Sunday and the sun's falling. I'm still out there wet waiting, just, you know, catching fish. And, you know, back in the mid 80s, you're catching 100 fish a day on the Shenandoah. And um, and I'm just looking around and the sun's setting. And I'm like, oh, my God, this place is gorgeous. I could just live here. Mm-hmm. And so fast forward. 30 years later and I'm the Shenandoah river keeper and I live about five miles away from where that, um, you know, where that all took place. And so, so um, but yeah, so I'm the Shenandoah river keeper and I'm uh, part of the Potomac river keeper network. And a lot of folks are very interested in, you know, who are river keepers, what do they do? And, and so, um, 
we are a non-governmental organization. Um, we're part of the Waterkeeper Alliance, which is actually an international alliance of uh, water keepers, bay keepers, river keepers, coast keepers um, around the world. There's a vast majority of them are in the United States. And within um, our region, there are 19 uh, keepers in the Chesapeake. And there's a, the Water uh, Keepers Chesapeake Group, which is sort mm -hmm. of the you know, the overseer or whatever of, of our um, folks. And it captures all of Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so as part of the Potomac River Keeper Network, there are three river keepers. There's the upper Potomac um, that, you know, goes from Harper's Ferry all the way um, up to the headwaters, Fairfax Stone and captures, you know, South Branch and uh, North Branch and um, everything up there in, in West Virginia and even up into Pennsylvania. And then there's the Potomac River Keeper, and um, that's Dean Nalyox, and, and Dean captures everything from Harper's Ferry all the way down to the mouth of the um, Chesapeake. Right. And then I'm on the hook for the entirety of the of the Shenandoah. Wow. And so North Fork, South Fork, and Main Stem. And so, um, you know, I have, a, you know, roughly 100 miles on the North Fork, roughly 100 miles on the South Fork, 50 on the Main Stem. And then... Um, and then, you know, there are the major tributaries the North, South and Middle Rivers as well. So, um, you know, this, the Shenandoah system drains about 3000 square miles. So um, it, it, you know, sort of captures a, a lot of real estate. Wow. 200, and, think about it, 250 miles of river just on the Shenandoah. Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. all fishable. And that's one thing, too, when he started this, like just when you look at the map, mm -hmm. like, you know, there's so much water out there that, you know, no yeah. one person can really oh, I know. fish it all in a lifetime. I, I you know. know. It, and, it, and so it's a, um, you know, it's a challenge. And, and, you know, there are times when I talk to people about, um, you know, something taking place on the, you know, some tributary mm -hmm. to like, say, the South River. And, you know, and I'll talk to some angler and he's like, you know, the bridge that's just up and, you know, and it goes here. And, and, and I mean, it's really it's kind of endearing that, that, um, you know, they, they believe that, you know, I have like this encyclopedic knowledge of every tributary right. and every stream. And I wish I did, but I, I really don't, but nonetheless, you know, we will definitely go <coughs> and investigate. Um, and so our, our mission, our role in life really is, um, to protect the, the river, to protect the Potomac watershed and protect the Shenandoah river. And, um, and really, we, we go about doing that um, in a number of different ways. And then the other thing that we do is that we promote river access and recreation because um, we believe the best stewards of the river are the, are the users of the river. And um, when something happens on the Shenandoah, um, you know, the Aftec plant, you know, back in the, in the 70s and 80s, and it's like if you never fished and someone says, oh, there is this, you know, PCBs in the river. Well, you know, big deal. I mean, who really cares if, if you've never been on the river? But if you get a father and son or a father and, and daughter and you go out and you fish five miles of, of the river and you start catching fish and all of a sudden you've, you've created a, a shared moment, a, a bonding experience. Well, in your mind now, you are the owner of that stretch of water. I mean, you've taken personal ownership of that water. And so, um, so for us, we we try to encourage people to get out on the in, on the river system and and to enjoy and, and explore the river. And so we work with the state to try to promote um, you know access points and and ramps and things like that. And then in the summer, we also um, put on a paddling series called River Palooza, and um, and we do different uh, you know on the Potomac. You know they'll do an overnight camp um, canoe camping trip up in the Paw Paw area. Um, on the, on the Shenandoah, I do, um, I, I do a birding trip and, and have a couple of birding experts, uh, come out. We'll do a snorkeling trip and we'll hit a stretch on the, on the river and go snorkeling. So you can actually get, you know, above in and below the, the water to see, you know, what are the fish there. And, and it's, it's really interesting, you know, you'll get in on the South Fork of the Shenandoah is where we go a lot for snorkeling and. You just hold yourself, you know, on a ledge and, and you're just snorkeling and you're very still and all of a sudden the smallmouth will start swimming around and, and you can just sort of observe them. And it's like, it's almost like you're watching television or something. And it's interesting to see 
how much um, smallmouth eat in the way of terrestrials and just small bugs and things like that uh, that are just in the in, in the water column. Was that your idea? That's really cool. About doing well, the snorkeling. Um, I would I would like to say that it's completely my idea, but that is not that is not <laughs> true. Um, uh, we partner with the with the U.S. Forest Service oh. and um, the U.S. Forest Service. Dr. Kim Winner, she runs their National Nature Watch program. And um, in that, um, she's the director of the Forest Service snorkeling program. And so we work with her and we work with um, Dr. Craig Rogue here down at the um, Southern Research Center down in Roanoke, um, Virginia. And, and so they come out with us and talk about the importance of public land and clean water and source water protection. And, um, and then we will bring out um, folks from um, the Audubon Natural Society and, um, and we'll do just a macroinvertebrate station and hmm. we'll just scoop up and see all the critters that are living in the, um, in the river. And based upon what you find in the water, um, you can determine uh, relatively easily that the health of the river, if there are, um, you know, little critters that are indicative of clean, healthy water and they're not there, that's a concern. But if they are there, it's like, oh, we're, we're you know, uh, swimming in a, a healthy aquatic environment. And so uh, we do that. We'll do an occasional fishing trip. Um, and then we also do a, um, uh, a whitewater uh, rafting slash kayak trip down in the Harpers Ferry area as well. And then there are other trips um, that the other keepers run on on the Potomac. So we try to get people out on the river. Um, and then when push comes to shove, uh, when it comes to our work and our, our mission, we will hold polluters, polluters accountable. Mm. I mean, we will um, take them to task. And so, um, you know, the, I'm on the board of the Friends of the Shenandoah mm -hmm. uh, River, and I'm a member of the Friends of the North Fork, and, and I have nothing but good things to say about friends groups. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, but friends groups, they do um, a lot of education and they bring kids out and mm -hmm. they bring teachers out and talk about the interrelationship between the mountains out here and, and the Shenandoah um, to Chesapeake Bay mm -hmm. and, and how all that water is linked. Um, but if we if we as river keepers have to litigate, we will litigate. Mm -hmm. I mean, we will we will take polluters to court if we need to, to ensure and protect the, mm -hmm. the, the water of the, of the Shenandoah River. What type of uh, law enforcement power do you guys, or what, what are, what is the scope of your powers? I mean, you're not yeah. throwing somebody in chains, I guess. No, right? like, no. Uh, um, we, we derive our, our power um, essentially from the Clean Water Act. And so this is the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. Uh, October 18th was the 50th anniversary. And in the Clean Water Act, it states that um, citizens have the right to take polluters to court mm -hmm. um, to protect the water, and so um, from a from a legal standpoint, that's where we derive our power mm -hmm. um, to um, to submit a a lawsuit to protect the river. Um, and so, the, the clean water, <laughs> a lot of really good things about it. Um, one of the challenges of the Clean Water Act, and when they when they when um, Congress wrote the Clean Water Act. They struggled with it 50 years ago, and we still struggle with it. And it's um, sort of the 800-pound the gorilla in the room. It's agriculture. And, and, um, and so when you read the Clean Water Act, they talk about point source pollution, essentially a pipe, a smokestack, um, a single entity that's putting um, pollute, you know, pollution in, into the river system. And, um, and agriculture is not a point source unless it gets to the, um, to a level of sort of industrial agriculture, a, a, uh, a CAFO, a confined animal feeding operation, and they are dumping material into the river. And so th then at that point, they need a, a pollution permit. And so in the Shenandoah Valley, there are roughly a um, hundred um, what are called VIPTES permits, Volusia, uh, Virginia Pollution discharge elimination system permit, I think, or whatever the acronym is. But essentially, it gives um, an entity the right to put material into the river system. And it, it could be a factory or a manufacturing facility. It could be a wastewater treatment plant. Um, you know, over on the South Fork of the Shenandoah, you have Merck, Merck, uh, Merck Pharmaceutical Company. Um, and so um, 
all of these um, permanent holders, they engage in a dialogue with Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. And then Virginia DQ, they determine that, um, you know, looking at everything that the river can handle, X number of pounds of this or so many pounds of that. And, and so they're giving what's called a, a TMDL, a, you know, a, a pollution load that they, that the river can handle. And, um, and, and so, um, and then they have to submit these reports and they're called DMRs, discharge monitoring records. And, um, and it, and it says the engineer on site or location says that, you know, on the, you know, 20th of November, we released so many pounds of this or so many pounds of, of that nitrogen or phosphorus. Um, and then people say, well, can't they just lie about it? You know, can't they just fudge those records and who's going to know? Well, <clears throat> when the engineer or the responsible person at the facility signs off on that, that is a personal signature and they are personally responsible that, that, um, what they put on this record is true and factual. And so if it turns out that there is an infraction and that they lied and that there's, um, you know, that they were not accurately reporting, uh, these records, then that individual is personally responsible. And mm -hmm. so it becomes much greater than just simply a, a civil matter. When you say that personally responsible, let's say you work for Bob's pharmaceuticals and you wrote your name, are you specifically held accountable or is it you and Bob's pharmaceuticals that are held accountable? If you sign it and there's a, there's a violation, say that, um, you know, you're, they're allowed to, to, um, put in a hundred pounds of, let's just say nitrogen. It could be anything, but let's say it's a hundred pounds of nitrogen. Yesterday, 150 pounds went in. And so they record 150 pounds. Well, you know, the, the gentleman or gentlewoman signing it, they accurately report it what happened. So they're not personally responsible for that. If 150 pounds went in and they said that only 95 went in, then then they are personally responsible because they're falsifying those records. Um, and it could be that when when, you know, they're permitted to put 100 pounds in and 150 pounds go in, it could be that there was a valve that failed. Mm -hmm. hmm. and, and, and that, you know, that there was just a, a manufacturing accident or, the, or, you know, or a pipe cracked due to cold weather, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just simply <clears throat> dealt with in a straightforward fashion. And you, and you see that two days later, the next DMR came and it was, you know, they got the valve repaired and it's back within, um, you know, their, their permanent numbers. Um, and so, but then you might see that it's really interesting in like, July, August, and September, this facility is slightly over their numbers. There are mm -hmm. a lot of numbers. And, and it's been that way for the last three years. Well, it could be that that they're operating at the absolute upper limit of the of the facility's ability to handle that material. Right. And that in warm water conditions, um, you know, it could be bacteria, it could be, um, you know, whatever, that it it increases the amount of material being released. And so that suggests that the facility needs to have an upgrade or the facility needs to do something additional to address this matter. Yeah, we see that up at Lake Holiday with uh, aqua and, you know, our waste. And, you know, it's interesting because you're right, that, you know, as far as reporting and stuff. But what gets me, though, is, you know, when they're holding tanks, we get a lot of rainwater, water, and it, and it can't hold that anymore. Right. They're going to expel that into the water system. And like to your point, yeah, they're going to record it now. They may have to pay a fine, but the the thing, the hard part with that too, though, that I have a problem with now. Once it dissipates into the lake, down lake, you know, it's not going to be a problem. But where it first discharges into that waterway, concentrated, that especially if it's during like a maybe a spawn, uh -huh. you know, where that 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 class that spawn class that fry is vulnerable. I mean, it could deplete that that you right. know, thing. So as I listen to you too, I think it's it's good. It sounds like it's regulated, but at the same time, is it? I guess then you got to back up too. Is that good for the fishery for the life in the that's right in that waterway? It doesn't sound like any of it's good. And let's also yeah. add context for the people at home that don't. Because example, I don't know this. Like, is this basically when you're saying these facilities and what they're allowed to dump? Is it literally like guys in trench coats dumping? 
you know, metal drums with a crossbones on it. Like, what do we mean by that? No, like, like he said, it's usually context. a pipe and maybe yeah, a it's valve. Usually is, a pipe, yeah. And it's, it's just leaked, a valve that they turn. Yeah, okay. yeah, and it, it's released and it's it's put in. Um, there's an outflow pipe. Okay. Uh, and so and, and so that's how it's it's uh, captured and measured as. Or maybe the pipe's released. gotten old and it yeah. hasn't been replaced. Like the infrastructure of the of the system itself, you know, and if you don't keep up with that, that, it, you know, then it, it springs a leak and right. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you, you know, a couple of other, you know, points about, about point source pollution, um, within the Chesapeake Bay, I mean, there's a tremendous um, push to clean up the Chesapeake Bay, mm. completely, totally 100% supported. It is a great mm. idea because not only is it cleaning up the bay, it's cleaning up the rivers at the mm -hmm. very Correct. top of the headwaters. And Correct. so some folks say, why do I care about Chesapeake Bay? That's where people mm -hmm. go for vacation for once, you know, a, mm -hmm. once a week in the summer. Well, the water doesn't just miraculously appear in the Chesapeake right. Bay. It appears from starting from far, you know, upstream. But um, within the cleanup of the Chesapeake Bay, there is um, work that goes on called nutrient trading, where um, where facilities are allowed to trade nutrient and and phosphorus credits and so this hmm. gets a little wonky but um it, it could be that for the chesapeake bay to clean up they're they're allowing 100 units of nitrogen to flow into into the chesapeake bay and as long as it stays below that 100 chesapeake bay is is happy you know the the, the net hmm. you know um um you know in the end result is that it's a, an improved chesapeake bay but within that, um, the the states and Virginia too, they allow nutrient trading to take place, and so it could be that um, uh, there is a manufacturing facility or a wastewater treatment plant, and they are exceeding their permanent numbers, and and so they're allowed to to dump a hundred units, and they're dumping hundred and ten regularly. Well, what they do is they go on the nutrient trading market and they find a facility downstream or possibly upstream. And they say, I, I want to buy 15 of your credits because you're a lot at 100, 100 units and you're only using 75 of your shady. units. <laughs> and so you got 25 credits to play with. And how about if I buy 15 of your credits? And so... And, and so from a Chesapeake Bay standpoint is the, the water is still improving, but they just bought 15 credits and so they don't have to improve their facility. Okay. And so, and, and when you get into the guts of it, it's like these trades need to take place within the watershed, mm -hmm. the river watershed. It's like, okay, that's fine. I can, I can live with that. But when you look at the watershed in Virginia, they're all, they view it as there are only five watersheds. There's the Potomac, there's the James, there's the Rappahannock, the York, um, and then um, um, and then sort of collectively the eastern shore rivers and streams. And so what was happening is that um, up towards um, Elkton, there was the uh, Massanutten wastewater treatment plant that um, addresses all the ski resort and things like that. Well, as soon as that place was built, they were exceeding their their numbers um it, it you know it was underbuilt and and um too many people started living there right away and and so they were always struggling to meet their 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 permanent numbers so they were buying credits in the new nutrient trading um credit system and so we went to court and we said you know that it's great that nutrient trading exists but why should the upper um, portion of the Shenandoah River system have to suffer? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're struggling with algae. We're struggling with harmful algal blooms. We're struggling with, yeah, at times, you know, bacteria and e, e. coli. Why should this facility be allowed to buy, buy credits and, and exceed their permanent numbers and everybody in the system, recreational users and everybody else, has to suffer mm -hmm. from that? And so... Because when you look at where the trades were taking place, remember the, the watershed that's taking place in is the Potomac watershed, not the Shenandoah watershed. So they could be buying credits at the very top up, you know, at Quail Run and, and Boone Run. 
but the credits that they're buying could be all the way down in Colonial Beach, Virginia, just before it hits the the mm -hmm. Chesapeake Bay, and they're all commingled into this giant bucket. So you don't know where these credits are coming from. Mm -hmm. So we we took them to court, and and we um, we never actually went to court, but once we no filed notice of intent to sue, mm -hmm. then they found religion, and and they're like, okay, fine. And so then DQ came back, and they said, you know what, um, you're right. This is not a good facility for nutrient trading. Um, and the Shenandoah it shouldn't have to suffer because of that. And, and so we are not going to um, allow nutrient, uh, nu nutrient credits to be bought and sold from this facility. And so what they then did is that they put uh, nutrient and phosphorus limits, numeric limits on that facility um, for both nitrogen and phosphorus. And then they accelerated the facility upgrade from four years to just one year mm -hmm. and the facility agreed to all that and so that took place and so you know a lot of that is just sort of in the background no one's ever really aware of it or anything else but, but you know we've been suffering from algae for the last 10 or 15 years and but it's little things like that that collectively can help improve the overall health of the of, of the river system. Have you heard of this credit or anything? Is this, I had this not. is some sneaky, you know, like corporate and this stuff. Is why, oh, I know. Yeah, it's goodness how, gracious. I will yeah. say though, that's why the, why they're so important. I mean, that oh. oversight, yeah. you know, and somebody watching and paying attention. I mean, I think, and then education yeah. is important too, but you're right. We just go out as users, use it. We don't realize what's going on behind the scenes just to the try layers, to protect yeah. the, protect the resource that we're, that we're enjoying. But yeah. just the fact that you think it's as simple as, you know, you just do blank and mm -hmm. then you realize like there's this whole other thing. Like I scratch your bat, mm -hmm. I'm going to buy credits and things. And, right. and I, as an outsider, it seems like that's a system that should just be done away with because there's, right. so, it, it allows for the ability to find loopholes versus right. just doing the right thing. Um, that, yeah. My mind's business blown about and that. money and yeah. There was another example, and I don't remember if it was you or, or uh, Jeff, but down south, and like a simple example where a guy was washing the outside of a building, and he was spraying it down. It was brick, and he was spraying it with a chemical cleaning. He was, his mm -hmm. job is to clean this building. Right. And, you know, they see that, and they're seeing the runoff, and there's water too. You know, they're spraying it with a chemical of the water, and they're watching where that water goes down into a drain pipe. Follow that down. You're talking about a pipe coming out, mm -hmm. and you look, and now it's draining into a stream. Mm -hmm. And right there at that stream where it's dumping in, you got a bunch of dead fish as a result of that chemical. And you go back up and say, "Hey, what are you doing? Well, this guy's just he's just doing a job." And again, it's like whether like fertilizing or anything. Sometimes we do things, and we don't in this concrete jungle out here. We don't realize what we're doing, what we're using, and the impact that has you know on a on a fishery mm -hmm. on a resource because it's out of sight, out of mind. But having that forethought right. kind of like you talked about too a tributary and how everything does flow into the chesapeake bay and we we, we as users have to be thinking about that as all this is running into the the rivers and the streams streams into the rivers creeks and then on down the line so. i, I want to add to that so it what is the <clears throat> definition of pollution and, and are let's say a construction company that, that's building houses close to the river is that the same thing or legally as a facility like like a ski resort that has these places where they're going to be dumping mm. water into the river every single year or a pharmacy company are they all in one conglomerate when it comes to pollution or, or is each one zoned differently how does all that yeah so so within the within the commonwealth when you get into the regs and dq that there are um, general operating permits and so there's a general operating permit for construction for development there's general operating construction for the use of biosolids and so they um you know these various um you know actions are are trying to like be put into similar buckets to to address that and so if uh, if a you know uh, housing development takes place well before you know digging starts they need to have silt fences put in place and they there needs to be either booms or or you know hay bales or you know whatever you see to ensure that that runoff that's going to take place as a result of that construction is captured and then it's not permitted to go into that um you know we, we saw that um i don't know it's probably two or three years ago um um down at morgan ford bridge where um, manassas run comes in there and um and it was just running absolutely 
just chock full of, of sediment and, but there was no rain within like the last three days and what's going on. And so we, we climb up the river and go up the river and, and it was, um, it, it was, uh, me and, and, uh, Karen Anderson with the friends of the Shenandoah river and Bill Howard with downstream project. And, and we followed it all the way up and, uh, was coming down an unnamed tributary and, um, Norfolk Southern, had a uh, large pond that it was dewatering and it ran it underneath the railroad tracks and they were just pushing out all of this and they were concerned about it getting too full and um and so they just took it upon themselves to drain it and but th they had no permit they had no anything they just simply did it and and we flew our drone up and and captured uh, video footage of the, the expanse of the system being drained. And when I discovered it and was, you know, looking at it and on the drone footage, they were running, it was like a large fire hose that they dug underneath the railroad track. And I was so concerned about that, that I contacted North, uh, Norfolk Southern security office, the, the, the railroad police to tell them about it because I thought that some landowner or farmer did this surreptitiously and never thinking in a million years that it was actually Norfolk Southern themselves that were doing that. And, um, and so, um, you know, when it was all said and done, they ended up, um, DQ hit them with a, a consent order, you know, saying what they were going to do to, to, to repair, um, the, the stream. And, and then they were hit with a, a $20,000 fine. And in Norfolk Southern, it's a couple billion dollar company that that's just, you know, that's just, yeah, I mean, that's just an, you know, and lunch money operating expense kind of thing. But nonetheless, it was considered fairly significant within DQ handing down, um, you know, handing down fines. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a lot of this activity that goes on and, and, um, you know, the work as the river keeper, you know, people say, where well, do you, you know, do you work for the government? No, we're a non-governmental organization. We get our money from, from individuals, from members, we get, um, funds from, um, foundations, um, other organizations, we get some funds from like the forest service. They'll give us some funds for our river blues system. So there are some government funds that we will, um, you know, take for specific actions and activities, but it's not like we're getting funded by, by, um, you, you know, the Virginia DEQ budget or anything, um, you know, like that. And, and, and the vast majority of our, of our money and, and funds come from just individuals. And it's important for us to have members, um, because if, if we find a, a, a business or wastewater treatment plant or manufacturing facility that is violating their permit and we want to take them to court. And so when you go to court, you, you, you have to submit um, an argument of like how you were injured, like, how were you hurt by this? Well, if we don't have any members in the area, we can't demonstrate that anybody has been injured by that. And so the court will dismiss that on what's called standing. It's like, you don't have a legal reason to stand in front of me because you're not injured. And so we, it's important for us to have members throughout our, uh, Shenandoah watershed. And so, um, and, and there are times that, that if we are going to provide a notice of intent to sue, um, we will ask individuals to write an affidavit. How were you harmed by this? How were you injured by this? Yeah. And a case in point is when we went, um, so we, I don't know, it's all a blur, but I think it was back in 2017, we sued, um, EPA in federal district court and be, for accepting Virginia's, um, what's called their impaired waters list. And so within the clean water act, it's a huge piece of legislation, but within the Clean Water Act, it states that um, even though it's a federal piece of legislation, it allows the states to enforce that law. And and so part of the, one of uh, the um, components of the Clean Water Act is called, it's real wonky, 303D, impaired waters list. And so every two years, the state has to submit a list of impaired waters, like rivers and lakes and streams, and why it's impaired. And it could be that it's impaired due to low dissolved oxygen or um, PCBs or whatever the, the reason and rationale is. And so we um, um, 
we talked to DQ that and, and said that the entirety of uh, the Shenandoah watershed needs to be put on the impaired waters list for either nuisance algae or excessive nutrients. And um, Virginia DEQ basically said, well, there are no numeric limits for nitrogen and phosphorus in free flowing streams, so we have nothing to measure it against, and so therefore it can't be impaired. So, so that was on the one iteration. So when the impaired waters list came around again for review and comment, we got probably 200 plus uh, individuals to write letters to DEQ stating that their use and enjoyment of the Shenandoah River has been impaired um, because of the heavy algae that's on the river and that we no longer fish there. We used to vacation there and we'll take our money and go to Maryland or Pennsylvania. And, and, um, and so our use and enjoyment has been impaired. And so to demonstrate standing, but also to demonstrate that even though there are no numeric limits, it's still impacting their, their ability to use and enjoy the river. And in the Clean Water Act, the Clean Water Act is very clear. It states that um, the states uh, need to have standards for, for water, and it could be numeric standards, like you know specific numbers, nutrient standards, numeric nutrient standards, or it can be a narrative standard. And so when we submitted these 200 plus letters for, you know, that goes to the narrative standard, then at that point, DQ, and I'm being somewhat snarky here. I, I, I do like DQ folks, and I think that they do really good work in lots of areas. But nonetheless, DQ said, oh my God, you want us to establish a narrative standard for this? That's, that's just too hard. That's just, we can't do that. And so, and, and then we also submitted all of these letters to EPA, to EPA Region 3 that covers Virginia. And EPA saw these letters and then they wrote to Virginia DQ and they said, specifically in the letter, it states, Shenandoah Riverkeeper is making an awful lot of very strong and valid, valid arguments here um, in this case. And we encourage you to go back and, and, and to reflect and, and review the list. DQ basically said, note it, and then resubmitted the list without having the Shenandoah River on there. EPA accepted it without having it on there. And then at that point, we went to court and we sued. And so we sued in federal district court and we lost. And, and so we thought about it and then we appealed and we lost. And, but nonetheless, even though we lost, if we were going to lose anywhere, I'd rather that we lose in court than in so many other instances. It, it, it nonetheless is still compelled Virginia DEQ first to stand up a Shenandoah algae methodology study because they were, weren't really doing a whole lot. And so they at least tried to construct a study to see, well, how bad is it? And, and they were doing um, analysis at five locations, two on the North Fork, two on the South Fork, one on the main stem. And we said, that's great, but, but heavy algal blooms occur throughout the entirety of the watershed, not just at these five locations. Like, it's just, I don't know, I just find it so fascinating, just the, the, the politics of it all, because it's never straightforward. And even just the, the credit thing, it's like, that is so sneaky how you can get away from it. But then also like a ski resort, that is such an obvious thing of, of course there's runoff every freaking year. Like mm -hmm. I live right next to Whitetail Ski Resort. And um, so I, it never hit me until you said that, like, oh my God, yeah, that would be a major contaminant. Because every year, like what goes into even making snow? It, yeah. Or is it just the runoff from the mountain? Like, that's, yeah, right. That, that's, yeah, that's a huge mm -hmm. thing that you'd have to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, um, so even though we lost in the appeals court, um, it, it, it's compelled DQ to start doing something. Sure. And, um, and so they stood up the Shenandoah algae methodology study and we're like, this is good, but you're looking at just five locations and these algal blooms can occur all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's not like there are only five corners in the county where right. drug deals are going down. And as long as we just mm -hmm. watch those five locations, we're good. Right. I mean, stuff can be happening anywhere. Um, and then the, and then the other thing that we got, um, to have happen is we, we had a, this was in the middle of, um, COVID. And so it was a Zoom call, but uh, David Paler was a, at the time was the director of, of um, DQ. And he had been the director for DQ for a very long time. And, um, and so we had been, you know, going at him for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but anyway, at, um, in the middle of, um, 
I think it was at the at the end in the fall of, of 2019, he agreed that DQ would develop numeric nutrient standards for nitrogen mm-hmm. and phosphorus mm-hmm. for the Shenandoah River system. And we're like, thank you very yeah, much. That's a, and that's about yeah. And and then and then that sort of morphed into it's going to be very difficult to establish nitrogen and phosphorus numbers because we're not really certain what the nitrogen, normal nitrogen background is, what the normal phosphorus background is. It's very challenging. Instead, we're going to use chlorophyll A as a sort of a stand in, and mm-hmm. they, they're doing something similar down in the James River. And then we're going to incorporate it into the um, triennial review, which is a sort of a rulemaking um, regulation that DQ goes through every, every three years. Long story short, just in the last month or two, the Virginia State Water Control Board, they approved the um, the standards for chlorophyll A for the entirety of the Shenandoah watershed, um, which is great. And But again, we say that this is a good first step. And it's like, why is that a good first step? Well, it's a good first step because these uh, chlorophyll A standards are only for filamentous algae, the, the sort of long seaweed here that you see in, in, in the river. And because it, it impacts recreational activity. I mean, like when you're fishing and your, your fishing fly or your lure gets, gets hung up in all the, the glop, you know, you come back and you have to strip it off mm. and make another cast. Or if you're paddling and you're, you're pulling up big um, paddles full of, of salad every, every you know, stroke, that, that's a pain. Well, and, and, and so I'm happy that they're doing it for filamentous algae. Um, but last year in, in July, over on the North Fork of the Shenandoah, we had a harmful algal bloom. Hmm. And so initially it was 10 miles, like mm-hmm. in the Strasburg area. Mm-hmm. And then it could expand it to 52 and a half miles, wow. all the way from Edinburgh up to Front Royal. And so, so we made the argument that this is a game changer because it's one thing to have your afternoon fishing trip mm-hmm. ruined or your paddling mm-hmm. trip, you know, messed up because there's a lot of algae. But mm-hmm. harmful algal blooms can be dangerous to humans, to mm-hmm. livestock, and to pets, mm-hmm. especially to pets. You know, if you know if your dog, uh, you know, is running around and then they go mm-hmm. down and happen to go into some water just downstream of where this harmful algal bloom is, and there's all these toxins in the water, mm-hmm. and they drink it. Dogs are especially susceptible at. Um, ingesting the water and getting uh, those toxins into their into mm-hmm. their um, bloodstream very quickly, and so you know we said that that this is good. This these uh, standards are good, but more needs to be done, mm-hmm. and so that's sort of where we are right now. Mm-hmm. And DQ is in the process, along with the uh, uh, VDH Virginia Department of Health, to develop the protocols and procedures on how they're actually going to test for this. And that one, to your point, I remember that was you're right this past summer, we were doing a company flow trip down on the North Fork around Tom's Brook and uh, mm-hmm. our neighbor, we got a lot down there, a neighbor reached out to me, emailed me, and I'd already gotten the, the report from the state mm-hmm. uh, Department of Wildlife Resources about that algal bloom and this section of the river. And so then like, you're right, you're forced to like, Hey, were we going to still do this is, you know, right. Uh, most of us don't worry about it, <clears throat> but you know, at the same time, but we were able to do it cause it was early enough. It, it kind of surpassed and we were fine, but you know, back to your talking about users, it does, it does affect, you know, the people that use this resource, right. um, whether you're fishing or floating or spending time with the family or whatever, it definitely, definitely affects, uh, the health of the river and then those that use it. So, yeah. And, um, you, you know, also, I mean, you know, talking about DQ, I mean, I know it sounds like I'm dumping on DQ, but they do a lot of good work. Mm-hmm. And and when this harmful algal bloom advisory took place last year, um, what became apparent is that neither DQ or Virginia mm-hmm. Department of Health had the funding necessary mm-hmm. to do adequate testing mm-hmm. um, as to how big is this? How right. dangerous is this? And in Virginia Department of Health, they're the ones that issue the advisory. This mm-hmm. is a health advisory. Right. But they don't have the ability to send technicians out to pull water samples. Correct. And and DEQ really did not have it in their budget to do that either. Nonetheless, as a courtesy to its sister agency, mm-hmm. DEQ did in fact go out there and they pulled water mm-hmm. samples and they, they looked at it. And then um, Virginia Department of Health they didn't have a budget to do any kind of harmful bloom, harmful algal bloom testing for freshwater rivers and streams. Mm. And so they robbed Peter to pay Paul and they took money out of their saltwater harmful algal bloom budget mm. for testing for the beaches. 
and they used it hmm. to test for the Shenandoah. And so all of those folks were doing everything possible mm -hmm. to do a good job. And Sounds I really, like, yeah, and it's a collaboration it, sounds yeah. like, and it checks and balances right? and making sure, you know, you guys are all holding each other accountable uh, again for the resource. Right. How, and, how does all that work when it comes to allocation of resources? And I, I just like a, a mile high view of it. So let's say I, you need the budget and I'm, I'm the Virginia DNR. Is that something then the next year I bid for to get an increased amount of money? Or is it basically, this is how much we get indefinitely and we just got to do the best we can. Yeah. So every two years in Virginia, the budget comes up for, for renewal. And, um, um, I'm probably not the best person to ask, but I think that the, the directors of the of the departments and agencies try to look at what they currently have and what they need, and try to forecast where these are additional concerns. Gotcha. And so, um, and and so it became a very apparent to us that going forward. DQ and VDH, they need a freshwater harmful algal bloom right. budget for systematic testing. Mm -hmm. And and not only that, but when when they did the testing last year, they pulled up the algal mat. So um, you know, when the harmful algal bloom occurs, you know, some people view it as like um, you know, the whole river turns green in a can, like a planktonic algal bloom will will discolor the entire river system top to bottom in the water column, you know, like a pea green soup. But you have these other algal blooms that they're these algal mats and and mm -hmm. and the toxins actually reside in the mats. Mm -hmm. And so um, DQ pulled algal mat samples and provided them to to Virginia Department of Health. And and they took it to their state certified lab to con to conduct the analysis mm -hmm. to see what they're dealing with. And the technicians in the lab following all safety protocols um, for this material, a couple of them got sick oh, wow. um, from dealing with this material. Huh. And so, um, so <laughs> they, they were, they got physically ill from wow. this dealing with this material. And so, so then it was the, the lab that they were contracting with said, um, we're, next year we're not doing the testing of the algal mat material. And so, um, and, and DQ did not have the budget for 2022 um, to, 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 to do any additional testing. So this year, instead of issuing a harmful algal bloom advisory on the North Fork of the Shenandoah, you had what was um, called an algal mat advisory. Mm -hmm. And so this 10 and a half mile algal mat advisory, which was just canceled just maybe a week or two ago, mm. um, said that you need to avoid mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the present, there are, um, algal mats mm -hmm. present here. Um, you and your pets and livestock, um, need to avoid this because mm -hmm. it may contain toxins mm -hmm. and, and, and they used some vague language because it could contain toxins or it could not contain, right. they don't know because they didn't test because they didn't have the yeah. budget to test it. And it's kind of ironic. I didn't mean to laugh as in, oh gosh, I got sick so much as it is ironic that again, we don't have a baseline. We don't have a lot right. of information on it. Um, when you think about health, um, you know, and it's, uh, again, that misinformation or, and again, to your point, it doesn't mean you can still go out and enjoy that and float, uh, just avoid those mats, but there is, there could be harm there. Right. If you're not aware. Right. And so, so we, um, you know, pursued and had conversations with DQ and VDH about, you know, budgets need to be put in place. And mm -hmm. we've talked with some legislators about, about that as well. Hmm. Um, and, and, uh, there, there was not a budget put in place in time for 2022, but what did in the governor Northam in the preceding administration, um, they put in a line item for a two and a half million dollar Shenandoah River harmful algal bloom study. Interesting. And and so that was put in um, in into the budget, and um, and it was going through. And then um, the gubernatorial election took place, and mm -hmm. Governor Yunkin came in, and we were concerned that with the change of administration, that that two and a half million dollar budget may be cut. And, and so we were worried about that. And, and then in the budget negotiation and compromise, 
what ended up happening was instead of the two and a half million dollars being cut, another one million dollars was added wow. for nice. a harmful algal bloom study to take place on Lake Anna because Lake Anna has been suffering yes. greatly from mm -hmm. from harmful algal blooms. Interesting. And so when that one million dollar line item was put in for Lake Anna, we all sort of breathed a sigh of relief mm -hmm. that it, this is going to survive. This right is going to make it. Yeah. It's, I, 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 we had, um, and guys, if you, if you've listened to all the episodes, you know, I got into it with Matt sell Maryland DNR about mm -hmm. wake boats being a massive issue on deep Creek. And what was funny is we both kind of came to the conclusion. It's like, it's going to be an issue until somebody's kid who has a billion dollar house there gets hurt because it's always who it is and it's so funny you say lake anna which is where everybody from dc mm -hmm. goes to vacation yep. and so it didn't take the shenandoah watershed possibly dying but you know what that's my vacation house so we need <laughs> yeah, to make right. sure that water <laughs> so, yeah yeah you're gonna put money right. there yeah. it's, it's so crazy it's like it's who it affects and then all of a sudden it becomes a, right we, we need to pay more attention to this yeah that's, and to your credit pushing those buttons oh like yeah, you said. yeah absolutely. I mean, uh, and in bringing it back around like you said the the loss was in a loss you're you're actually bringing it bring it to light and you're moving in the right direction and educating people and and that's that's good that's good news yeah and it's it's particularly challenging because on the potomac um you know there there are, i mean population density and then there's mm -hmm. also lots of point source pollution areas like the the luke paper mill further up on the on the potomac mm -hmm. and uh, and other paper mills and in legacy mining and things like is that is it below hancock or above hancock um it's above hancock Han okay. yeah um and and so you you have you know these um you know these point source pollution that can be handled with a lawsuit with you know mm -hmm. involving the clean water act and the Shenandoah harmful algal blooms, it, it's as mushy as it looks in the in the water of like, mm -hmm. who's responsible for that? Where, like, mm -hmm. who's going to address this? How is this going to happen? Mm -hmm. And and so there's a lot of collaboration that goes on to, to um, you know, try to get the forces to be to start paying attention to things. I mean, like mm -hmm. last year when, when um, you know, this 52 and a half harmful algal bloom advisory occurred, people were saying, aren't you upset? And I'm like, yeah, I am upset about that. But on the other hand, um, in a weird way, almost relieved because this is not the first harmful algal right. bloom that ever occurred on North Fork of the Shenandoah right. or for the South Fork for that matter. It's just simply the first advisory that had ever been right. issued. And for the last few years, we have been submitting photographic evidence showing potential harmful algal blooms, you know, these massive algal mats. And we've been submitting them to DQ. We've been submitting them to Virginia Department of Health. And, you know, we were sort of getting a thank you very much for your mm -hmm. contribution and national security pat on the head and not anything really else was being done. And so when when um, we submitted the photographs of what was going on in the Strasburg area um, and then a week later, 10 days later, Virginia Department of Health issued their initial 10 and a half hmm. mile harmful algal bloom to me it was somewhat gratifying that finally they're paying attention yeah. they're, they're, they're paying attention to this and so um so from so from that standpoint i was almost relieved when it when it was finally issued and that yeah we, we need to do something about this so back to the sediment on morgan's ford that yeah. and also like you're talking about pictures was that something that that you you're testing water and you find it or how did you how did you i mean that led you all the way up to the railroad right um, the initial finding, and then also with the pictures, is that you and, and a team of yours, or is it is it uh, users, members? Yeah. So, How are you getting that information? Yeah. So um, th th that's a, it's really interesting because we first caught wind of it with Friends of the Shenandoah River. Mm. They do systematic testing, okay. and uh, uh, Karen Anderson she mm -hmm. runs the lab and she pulls water samples there mm -hmm. at Morgan Ford, mm -hmm. and. Um, and she noted that it's running heavily discolored. Is that right there? And um, yeah. And so at, at Morgan, just upstream, like immediately upstream of the bridge okay. um, is where Morgan Ford runs in. And and it was running dirty. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, we started hiking up and looking and discovered that, oh, it's coming in from this sort of unnamed tributary. And, um, hmm. and so that's how we discovered, uh, mm -hmm. that, um, and the, 
um, you know, and then we hiked up further and then uh, used our drone and and um, and got that to happen. Um, mm -hmm. Another case in point is just in the last two weeks, we got a report hmm. Millville Dam um, mm -hmm. on the main stem of the Shenandoah. Uh, there was an angler um, fishing and uh, they were doing dam work on the front of the dam. And there was this oily sheen on the water hmm. and, um, and this didn't look right. This doesn't look healthy, whatever else. And so, uh, we, we caught wind of that on the afternoon and the next day, um, my program manager, Alan Lehman, he went up and grabbed, uh, samples and we got a video of it also. Hmm. And, um, and there were, uh, contractors uh, working for PEI Hydro that that owns the dam, um, and they were using material and they were filling voids on the front of the dam, and and all the sort of spillage and everything was just coming down river. That's crazy. So you can almost and, see the Google Earth guys, and you guys can watch this if you're watching on YouTube. So this is the Millville Dam that I have up right now, um, and you can almost see that there's like a place right here that the cars can just, yes. you know, construction vehicles can just park right there. Yeah. And so, so this material was, was flowing down, um, from the, from the face of the dam. And so I contacted P hydro and I'm like, first off, I want the, the, um, MSDS sheet, the, the, um, safety sheet. Um, yeah. On, on what these chemicals are and, and, and are they environmentally safe? And, and I think that you should stop doing any more work on this until you provide that. And then you need to either have a boom in place or that you need to have some kind of skimmer um, apparatus to be picking up all this material. And, um, and then she immediately wrote back um, saying, um, I'll, I'll get you the, I'll get you the, the safety sheet. Um, I need to talk with, with him about that. And then a couple of days go by and she said, Oh, by the way, they had completed work. So there's no additional work um, scheduled right now for, for Millville dam. And then, you know, I ping her a couple of days later and she said, you know, we just did a thorough review and, um, and we've, um, done three things. We've upgraded our standard operating procedure to, to address the, the, the matters that you had just raised. Um, we are going to employ either, um, booms or skimmers going forward for any of our other dams. And then we're also going to have, um, a single point of contact to, to be, uh, um, you know, a, a watch person mm -hmm. to ensure that there's no material that, that wow. are escaping downstream. And, and then that's all good. But when they wrote the letter to me, you know, they, they also said that, um, you know, the safety sheet said this is all rather benign. And then I, I had a, you know, a biology, a fisheries biologist, a doctorate say, well, not so quick here, Holmes. Um, it's, um, it, you know, yeah, it's going to release carbon dioxide, which is not that big a deal, but there is a lot of residue that's going to be dropping to the, to the, to the river bottom. And so, um, if they're going to do these other three things, you know, I might give them a pass, but, um, you know, this, this does impact. And if fish were swimming through that material and, and these polymers were coating their, their gills or their, um, their skin, you know, it could have serious negative consequences as well. There was not a fish kill that was seen. Um, no one had any, um, evidence so there's no photographs. So there's no one discussed that there was a, a, a fish kill, but that was an, that started with an angler. That started that with an, made a fun. What's fascinating to me, mm -hmm. they, these guys, and, uh, I know when we had a situation, I believe they, they respond within the day. I mean, they're on top. I mean, you're, you don't wait around, which you can't because, yeah, Time, times of the essence. Times of the essence, but uh, man, that's that's that's. And guys, again, amazing. a link in the episode description to everything that we're talking about here, include as the phone numbers that you need to call if you're out on the water and you see something. Again, see something, say something, uh, is so vitally important. One thing when I was scrolling through that I was so interested in about Millville is you have all these rock quarries right here. Mm -hmm. um, what happens to these when eventually they are no longer used? Um, are, does the water just sit there? Does it run back off into the Potomac or the Shenandoah? Like, how will that process work? And if it does end up having to go into the Potomac or Shenandoah, does that become your responsibility as, as a river keeper of the Shenandoah? Um, it's a concern of ours. I mean, there have been reports and, and we've responded to them where all of a sudden there's a, a chalky uh, material entering the, the river and, um, and, you know, we'll go up and we'll talk to them and it's, 
it's limestone dust. Mm -hmm. And so um, West Virginia environmental folks, they um, the regulations are not as strong perhaps mm -hmm. as in, in Virginia. Um, and so they'll, um, you know, they may turn a blind eye towards that. Um, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's challenging of like, are we dealing with just, um, you know, pollution in the eyes of Virginia, um, falling, there's three kinds of water pollution, sediment, toxin, and, um, um, nutrients. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so if it's just sediment and it's just, it's limestone dust, is, is that negatively impact the river? Is it is it going to neutralize any any pH? Is it um, it's it's somewhat questionable. Is this a benign activity or is this something that is of, of a greater concern? Um, and so it's really sort of handled on a case by case um, basis. It could be another concern is that if the you know abandoned or no longer used quarry has a massive harmful algal bloom going on mm. and it's all captured in the quarry. And it's contained, no big deal. But. Well, if that's dumped into the river, it becomes a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's it's hard to say that there's you know one size fits all. And so, um, you know, that's that's a challenge, you know, for us, and it's a challenge for uh, government regulators to see what it is that they're actually dealing with. And, so, and that is fascinating. Oh, I'm sorry to okay. cut you off, but to finish with this, like this is such a unique area of the country where you have West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia, like mm -hmm. all meeting. And mm -hmm. then like Millville Dam, I could be wrong, but is that entity owned by West Virginia? Is that, where does that jur jurisdiction fall? Because now you're into like West Virginia. Mm -hmm. for, yeah. Is that still a phone call that you're allowed to make? Or is that past your jurisdiction? Or is it- No, where our, our, our jurisdiction is for the entirety of the, of the Shenandoah. And so it's okay. just that we- um, I feel um, Virginia has probably better regulations in place on gotcha. environmental matters than West Virginia does. Virginia also has a, a piece of legislation called the Agricultural Stewardship Act that West Virginia does not have that we can mm -hmm. that we can use um, for non-point source mm -hmm. pollution, um, cattle herds in the river, for mm -hmm. example, things of that nature. Um, and so, um, yeah, so even though it goes from Virginia into, into West Virginia, um, you know, as the river keeper, I'm still on the, on the hook for that. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. That's as a former guide, um, and now river keeper, and you mentioned the eighties I mean, the eighties and the nineties were, were, was a prime time for the mm -hmm. Shenandoah river. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you had some fish kills right. and then it just kind of really went downhill Seems to be coming back now from reports I've been hearing, but kind of report card on the health and state of the river uh, currently, and then just maybe the history to current and where, where how's it looking right now? Yeah, you know, I, I think that um, this year, I mean, it's anecdotal. I mean, from my own personal experience fishing on the river, I think that the river fished pretty well this mm -hmm. year. Um, I think it, it fished, you know, uh, pretty good last year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I mean, when you look at Virginia DWR biologist, you know, um, analysis, I mean, you see reduction in the in the smallmouth bass population. Um, and, you know, well, well, why is that? Well, you know, there could be a host of host of factors. I mean, um, um, in, in concerns, uh, you know, we are as the Shenandoah Riverkeeper, I pulled together in 2019, the first ever. Um, Chesapeake Bay smallmouth bass um, health assessment. And I, I brought biologists from the Shenandoah, the Upper Potomac, the Potomac, and the Susquehanna rivers together. And 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 also um, Dr. Vicki Blazer and Dr. Um, Heather Walsh from the USGS Fisheries Lab um, in, in, in West Virginia. And, um, and it was interesting because all different river systems, but all with very similar tales of woe. And, um, and so we did that in 2019, we did it in 2021 and, um, um, we're in the planning stages of making that happen in March of this year, uh, for uh, 2023. And, and also in 2021, we brought in the biologist from the James river as well. Um, and, and we talked about, you know, I mean, fish kills are a legitimate concern. I mean, we had massive fish kills and I think, um, my predecessor, Jeff Kelby was in here and, and talked about fish kills in 2004, 2005, um, just massive, just, you know, just decimated the fishery. Um, and then it seemed like every, 
three or four years after that, you would have a another fish kill, but it was not at the 2004, 2005 level, but it was still, you know, a, a legitimate concern. Um, and it, but it also showed just how resilient the smallmouth bass population is, is that if it had the the good fortune to have a good healthy spawn the following year, it could bounce back um, pretty quickly. And so what, what we're seeing now that's a concern in all of these in the Chesapeake Bay watershed um, are reduce, you know, spawning success. And, um, and, and a lot of the biologists were telling the same story of you have high water during the nor during the spring spawning time, you know, April, May, and, and that may spill into June up on the Susquehanna. Um, but you have high water. And um, and then by the time that the high water subsides, as that's dropping, you have water temperatures increasing. And so you really to have a really successful, you know, kick butt spine, you need sort of that Goldilocks window where you have the proper water level and you have the proper water temperature and that's just to get the fish to have a good spawn and and, and to survive that um, and so you're you're seeing that water levels were too high in during the normal spawning period and then when they finally dropped the water temperatures were already in exceedance of 65 degrees fahrenheit and so you were seeing reduced spawns taking place and if and if the you know poor spawns happened one or two or three years it's like not that big a deal because a lot of those fish and the year classes above and below could exploit the food in that niche you know that they could um, you know eat up or eat down but when the spawning year classes it goes from you know poor spawns one two three years to four five six years seven years all of a sudden you start to see the entire population start aging out and 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 that becomes a, a dramatic concern, um, and so um, you know that's a legitimate concern. And then and then you can you know dump on top of that, um, you know all of the other sort of environmental factors that that these um, fish need to contend with of endocrine disruptors and pesticides and herbicides and and um you know in the shenandoah valley i mean agriculture is a tremendous um uh, you know business it's the largest um industry in in virginia it generates roughly 90 billion dollars in in revenue across the board virginia farmers they're good people they're hard-working people um and they try to do the right thing and so but say the spawn is just starting and oftentimes, you know, that spawn is going to take place in April to May, you know, usually like mid April timeframe. Well, the farmers are doing the right thing and they're trying to protect their soil. So they put a cover crop on of, you know, rye or, you know, oats, clover, you know, whatever it is that they're putting on to protect their topsoil, which is all good. Um, and now they want to engage in no till farming to keep all that um biomass on the soil which is great so they use an herbicide to knock that down as they get ready for their spring planting and so they put on atrazine which is a very common herbicide um, and very effective and, and very you know cost effective at, at knocking down the cover crop but it can be it can be deadly to marine life and so if they put it down on a thursday and there's no rain forecasted for the next 72 hours no big deal if they put it down and all of a sudden it the weatherman gets the the forecast wrong, and a big you know storm cell uh, sits on top of this this farm's field, and that atrazine gets washed off, and it gets into the the river where these fish are spawning. Well, all the eggs are there, and the neurological development is going on, and and um, and um, in that development, these fish are making a determination neurologically, am I male or female? And it disrupts that neurological development. And so all of a sudden you start seeing, and, and Dr. Vicki Blazer with USGS, she was the first scientist to discover the presence of intersex fish, fish having both male and female genitalia in the, in the upper Potomac and, and on the Shenandoah and on the Susquehanna. And so, um, you know, they found that here. And since then they found it elsewhere in the, in the country. Um, 
and and so I mean that's a concern. But you know, so you with you know going back to the health, it's not just a fish kill decimating the population. It's also the inability of the population to reproduce and to to keep those good numbers that they that they have. And then and then and then oh by the way, you have these you have these algal blooms taking place, and and once the algal blooms start, it's very challenging for subaquatic vegetation, the good grasses, the star grass, the wild celery, the elodia taking place to act as a nursery for all those fish fry. And instead you have this algae and, and those, those fish and little critters living on the bottom, you know, they're not going to survive when that, when the bottom is just coated by this thick algal mat blanket. And so they either have to move or they're going to, they're going to, you know, die. And so collectively all these things make it extremely challenging for, for smallmouth bass to, to, um, to, to, to thrive the, the way we have in, in, in the past. And so it's so just challenging. In your opinion, is the smallmouth population in the river better or worse than in 2004 right now? Like where? Well, from sheer numbers, it's better. Um, I mean, it, it, that 2004, 2005 fish kill probably decimated, uh, I'm guessing 80, 90%, maybe higher in places. So from sheer numbers, we are much better off, mm -hmm. um, now, um, you know, when I, I came into, um, you know, this position, there were probably 75 or 80 cattle herds that were directly accessing the river and just ripping up the stream bank and, you know, dropping sediment into the, into the river and just using it as their free watering source. Um, you know, we've been able to use the agricultural stewardship act and, and, um, the soil and water conservation districts have talked to lots of farmers and gotten those, ha those cattle herds out of the river and given them either put in stream exclusionary fencing or alternative watering sources. And so that number is down in the single digits. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to say that it's exactly seven, but it's, you know, when it gets down in the single digits, it starts taking on the characteristics of like a county fair whack-a-mole game where you bang one down over here and another one pops up over, over there. But nonetheless, collectively, we're much better off um, with the reduced number of cattle herds um, in, in the in the river system. Uh, there's a greater awareness of bacterial levels in the um, that are in the river. Um, and um, I think that the counties also recognize um, the importance of of tourism dollars in in the Shenandoah Valley, and they want to they want to try to protect the resource and not necessarily turn a blind eye as to what's going on. Um, and I think that DEQ and and VDH, for that matter, are are taking a, a you know a, a real concern about the health of the river system. And so I think all of those things exist now that did not exist in 2004, 2005. And so from that standpoint, I think that we're much better off. I mean, anecdotally, at least, and again, I'm not on the river as much as you, but I grew up on, on the main stem in the Shenandoah and Loudoun County. Um, it, the numbers are definitely better. I remember 2004 and a couple of years after you couldn't catch anything. Oh yeah. And now it, it has gotten better in that sense. And then you look at like, you know, we have Travis Eden, you know, guys, you can see an image right now up above my head, you know, him holding walleye that are massive and small yeah. mouth. And I, I think it is ticking in the right direction, but, but two things I wanted to hit on. Um, the first is what, and I, everyone always is mixed on this. W would a supplemental small mouth stocking benefit to help the natural ebbs and flows of the cycle? Yeah. So, um, that's, that's a good question. I'm of mixed mind about that personally. Um, um, the fact of the matter is there is going to be a supplemental stocking. Um, uh, um, and, and that's due to, uh, another pollution settlement. Um, there, there was, um, and still is a, a, a chemical plant down in Waynesboro, Virginia on the South river. It was the DuPont plant. And I think it's changed hands since then, but, um, DuPont used mercury in the manufacturing process for rayon and nylon from 1929 until 1950. And 1950, they stopped using mercury. And all of the mercury used was supposed to be captured in a retort facility. Uh, think of like a giant like witch's cauldron and all the mercury is going to drop in that. So none of it would get into the soil or into the river. So 1950s, they stopped using it. Mid-1970s, they were doing a facility expansion down there on the South River in Waynesboro. They discover the presence of mercury in the soil. 
They test some more. They discover the presence of mercury in the river itself on the South River. Numbers are high. And they're like, oh, the, the mercury numbers are going to fall um, over time. It's going to subside. And so you would see this gradual reduction of mercury. And then a high water event would come. And what was happening is the mercury was being pushed to the stream banks. And then and then high water would come and it, would, it was sort of like a giant washing machine just sort of agitating the stream bank and reintroducing all that mercury. So, um, and, and so they were finding mercury in the system. And so they established the South River Science Team to, to monitor this. And, and, and everybody was saying, DuPont, you need to do something about this. And so there was this constant debate and fight that was going on that continued on and no one could agree as to what these terms would be. Well, now fast forward to the 2000 teens to uh, 2020, whatever it was, maybe 2015, um, DuPont and Dow chemical plants, they entered negotiations to merge. And at that point, crap became real because the lawyers got together and there's like, no kidding, what are the liabilities that you're on the hook for on the books for this? And, and what are we going to owe for, for all of this mercury in the river system? And so at that point, DuPont, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Virginia DEQ, and Virginia Department of Gaming and Fisheries, now Department of Wildlife Resources, all got together and they reached a figure of $42.3 million. And so that was the largest settlement after the Gulf oil spill mm. um, in, in the United States. And that money was put into like five or six different buckets. There was like $18.5 million to put into a, um, an escrow account to purchase land as it became available on the riparian buffer, the shoreline of the river system on the South River and on the on the um, South Fork of the Shenandoah, which was a, I thought was a brilliant idea. There was money set aside for mussel repropagation, the money set aside for um, neotropical migratory songbirds because they found out that songbirds in the Shenandoah Valley, their songs were being dumbed down because of the ingestion of mercury. They're hmm. making that is so cool. People and, figure wow. that yeah. stuff out. My and, God, I know that's <laughs> crazy. That's and, fascinating. And <laughs> and so and hmm. and the plumage was was becoming duller. Um, and so for reproduction of these songbirds, um, you know, they want good songs and they want bright colors mm -hmm. and and they weren't getting that and so it was impacting their their population and mm -hmm. so they they put money in there and then sort of as a separate and standalone pot of money separate from the 42.3 million dollars was a pot of money for up to 10 million dollars for the renovation of the front royal fish hatchery and the front royal fish hatchery was built in the 1930s during the works project um agency um era and it was it was in woefully bad shape, and um, some folks wanted that um, fish hatchery to be put down in Waynesboro, which is where the damage occurred. And for whatever reason, I, you know, questioned it myself, but for nonetheless, the front royal fish hatchery was the one that was selected to be renovated. And and um, if you go over there now, it looks very close to being done. And talking with the biologist, it should be online. And, and ready to go come spring of this year. The plan is, is that they're going to raise 35,000 um, smallmouth bass fingerlings every year. And initially, they're going to be reintroduced into the South River system and then at selected locations on the South Fork of the Shenandoah. And, and the question is, are those 35,000 smallmouth bass going to make a hill of beans of a difference? Question is, we don't know. And so they're they 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 plan on putting them and introducing them in and um and they're gonna um um you know be able to identify these smallmouth bass through either tetracycline um use in their in their eardrums or fin clips or however they want to go about doing it to be able to make a determination and so there is going to be a supplemental bass spawn but when you start getting into sort of the guts of it it's like thirty five thousand three inch fish like, is that going to really do anything? There was a supplemental smallmouth bass spawn. I, I forget uh, some other states, um, Michigan or someplace. And so they inserted the, these fry and they went back to test and they couldn't find any of them. They were just 
you know, just pray at that point. And so will these 35,000 make a difference? We, we don't know. I mean, I give Department of Wildlife Resources credit. They're, they're trying to protect the resource and do the best they possibly can. Um, but, but we don't know if that's going to happen. And so what's interesting, though, is that, you know, in the larger sort of DMV area, you have a supplemental spawn going on in Maryland right now. And, and they're putting in smallmouth bass in five locations on the Potomac and then talking with the biologist, um, Brandon Kiplinger up in, up in West Virginia, they too are going to be doing a, a pilot program supplemental stop, uh, spawn, uh, for, for smallmouth up in, up in those waters as well. And so the concern that I have is that you're, you're protecting the population, but you're not really protecting you know, like, like the spawn is failing for a reason or multiple reasons, you know, not enough water, too many chemicals, too much algae, you know, you can, you know, pick your poison, all these various reasons. And, and are we just simply trying to introduce fish and put a band aid on the population so people continue to buy fishing licenses, but there's no real improvement to the river system itself. So, um, and, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, this money has been put in place. There is going to be a supplemental spawn. And I'm, I'm curious about it. I mean, you see mixed results in the trout world, um, you know, are, you know, stock trout, you know, does it dumb down the population? Does it introduce a potential for whirling disease? Um, you, you know, does it impact native, um, you know, brook trout fish, you know, whatever the case is. I mean, there are implications to what's going on. I'm just concerned that we're not doing anything to fundamentally improve the quality of the ecosystem in the, in, in the water and that we're just throwing more fish. You know, I agree yeah. with you. You always said, Thomas, you were kind of, you, I think you're, philosophy was it the lows won't be as low yeah um, th this thing is near and dear to my heart because i i've done tons like guys as you know if you've listened to all the episodes um i'm big into reading the different research and literature coming out from the texas department of fish and game tennessee places that have been doing supplemental stocking for decades and really pioneered it and then you look at what happened on the james river and the rappahannock where mm -hmm. The, no one cared about it. It was terrible. Right. And then they did do the F1s. It did mm -hmm. work. You can mm -hmm. see that because the gene pool has changed. And now everyone in the nation knows about the James. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens now, because everyone knows about the James, if the James tanks, now it's a national story. Right. It's not just a local story. And I think it's so important to, to be aware of this optically. And then Odenkirk, I think, put this together for us. Like our resources can only go to so many places. Mm -hmm. And if we don't know about a place or if it doesn't get attention, why mm -hmm. should we put resources? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what hurt the Shenandoah. Mm -hmm. And again, guys, this is just in my head. If this was the <clears throat> Susquehanna that had this fish kill when Bassmaster goes there three times a year, that immediately would have been a story. Right. But it's the Shenandoah. And right. I think the idea of big picture, we need the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac to be pumping out 20 to 25 pound stringers mm -hmm. of smallmouth because mm -hmm. if it becomes a national place, mm -hmm. it won't have as low of lows because it will always be in the mm -hmm. spotlight. And so I think you have to attack it from both ends. I mm -hmm. think we're being very, we're being really, we're reacting to what has happened. We're not being proactive, we're right. being reactive. We need to proactively fix the water system. Mm -hmm. And then we also need to proactively help support good genes mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. And if we did that to begin with, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be where we are. Do I think the supplemental stocking will work? It, it Based on the research, it's volume. Mm -hmm. I don't know if 30,000 a year will work. When you're talking Texas where they're dumping 100,000 per year, that's where you see the mm -hmm. uptick of if mm -hmm. a couple make it to 10 pounds, that's mm -hmm. all you need to have eyes on it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's a step in the right direction. And right, what I'm looking agree. at is with what we had John Mullican on the show and he talked about it. <clears throat> right. If you have Maryland stocking smallmouth, if you have now West Virginia stocking smallmouth, mm -hmm. if you have them stocking small with the Shenandoah, one of those is going to work because mm -hmm. collectively you're going to get some of these big mm -hmm. broods to actually get of age and then reproduce. Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw, um, I think it was Rocky we had on the show in May and mm -hmm. they were 21 pound stringers coming out of the upper Potomac between right. Harper's Ferry and Brunswick. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I mean, I don't remember a time there's that many big yeah. smallmouth on the upper. So the upper Potomac's coming back. Yeah. And it's just, it's something, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. And the Shenandoah had, I mean, they had that in their day too, the 20 pound bags. But I think, and I think your point, you're exactly right. Like when you mentioned trout too, and that was our thing of even take the dollars spent on licensure and what are we fishing for? Now, granted, again, everybody's different. You know, mm -hmm. some are walleye, mm -hmm. muskies right. really growing right now. You got a lot of trout anglers. 
but is that percentage based on you know population of of users? Again, in smallmouth, still I, I believe smallmouth is still one of the the most targeted species oh, of far. fish, especially on the Shenandoah yeah. River. I mean, yeah. there's some good largemouth population too, but the smallmouth is a is a great. We got guys traveling to you know Buffalo and Erie to to target the smallmouth, you know, right. because that they're they're interested in that that species. And so I think, and I think if you tackle it to your point, you're right too. Of that's a supplemental, but then do almost like your trout unlimited. I'm always fascinated by the trout guys, where their boots on the ground, they're they're member based, hands on, move these rocks, put them in place, mm -hmm. make that stream a better livable area for the trout. You know, cut this tree, put this. You know, mm -hmm. really a hands on approach to to the actual to your point the 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 ecosystem. Right. Um, and they're raising trout in the classroom. So if you can attack that from both angles, then I think you will, you know, potentially have something good. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm jury's still out of things, what you're saying too. Yeah, and I agree. Still, it is, and, it's, and, yeah. and I'm hopeful that it is going to work. The concern that I have is that, that, um, that nothing fundamentally changes environmentally in the, right. in the river system That's right. and that in that <clears throat> harmful algal bloom 52 and a half miles occurred on the north fork of the right. shenandoah which edinburgh to front royal there aren't any major outfitters on that stretch but if that 52 and a half miles occurred from say Lou Ray or Elkton all the way yeah. down to Front Royal. The economic impact on that, I mean, you could have all the five pound fish you want in that river right. if no one's allowed to be on the water due to a harmful algal bloom advisory. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's important just from an economic standpoint of all the B&Bs and the vacation and the hotels and, and tackle sales and everything else. I mean, you know, it, it would have a huge negative impact um, if, if a harmful algal bloom occurred over on the on the South Fork of the Shenandoah. Is there anything natural that can be done about, or I guess organically done about the algae blooms? So example, like with, with uh, you know, aquatic vegetation, uh, you mentioned, I believe it was mussels or clams, uh, mm -hmm. doing a restocking program about that, crayfish. Is there anything on, on that level that can be done to help with that? Yeah, so there, there I mean, part of that um, uh, $42.3 million in that DuPont settlement, $4 million was for mussel repropagation. And majority of the, the is being um, spent down at Virginia Tech. Um, it's difficult and challenging to to propagate mussels, um, and they're also uncertain. Are there mercuries? Did the mussels disappear in the Shenandoah due to elevated mercury levels? And so, what's the threshold for mercury? Scientists don't really know. And so, um, but nonetheless, it has the potential to certainly help. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that these harmful algal blooms are not a naturally occurring um, event. Certainly algae occurs in any any freshwater or any water system. You're going to have algae. It just, it's going to naturally occur. What's not natural is to have these harmful algal blooms. And why are they occurring? Well, I mean, in the Shenandoah Valley, you have 155 million chickens being raised every year. You have 18 million turkeys being raised every year. You have about 550,000 head of cattle being raised every year. That poultry litter, that cattle manure, it needs to go someplace. And so when it's put on land where there's an agronomic need for it, for the crops, it's wonderful. It's, it's an inexpensive fertilizer um, that's excellent for, for, the, for the crops. If that material is put on overly saturated land, land that's already saturated with phosphorus, with nitrogen, um, then it just became, becomes a convenient waste disposal system. Mm -hmm. And and without getting too techy on the science, um, soil can hold on to phosphorus. And but once it it gets saturated, it's it's like, you know, think of like, you know, you can hold a couple of tennis balls in your hands and those are nitrogen or phosphorus molecules. Once you you got a couple of handfuls, you can't hold anymore. And so that phosphorus just runs off that soil and into the river system. And that phosphorus is like fast food for algae. It's like the perfect um, nutrients for 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 algal blooms to occur. And so, um, you know, that's why the importance of riparian buffers that you put in 35 to 50 to 75 to 100 feet 
of vegetative buffer, natural grasses, natural bushes, natural trees, to absorb that excessive nutrients before it hits, um, it gets into the water. And so, so that's why that $18 million was set aside um, in, that, in that DuPont settlement was to buy land, riparian buffer, buy shoreline to, to address that. Um, and so, and then also in that 42.3 million, there was another, uh, don't quote me on the exact number, one to $2 million put in place to improve um, access points and boat ramps. And so you've seen improvements to um, the, the Alma boat ramp over on the South Fork to Morgan Ford on the main stem. Um, and so you're seeing um, funds put in place to help the angler um, access the river system for use and enjoyment. Would, is there anything, would there be an introduction of something into the water to help filter it out? You know, a, a classic example is, and I'm not condoning this, but, you know, Lake Erie used to have horrific water quality and then zebra mussels got in there and it, it was like a Brita filter. And that's something that's extremely hardy that can survive anything. And it does help, you know, remove certain toxins from the water. Um, is there something that could be introduced, not zebra mussels, that could actually help with this, filter the water and clean it out? Is that even something on the table? Yeah, well, you're, you're seeing a couple of things. One is that um, um, phosphorus internationally, globally, there's a shortage of phosphorus um, from a from a, um, a fertilizer standpoint. I mean, worldwide, you know, with growing, you know, I think the world population just exceeded or is getting ready to exceed 8 billion people. And so there is a there is a shortage of phosphorus. And if you could extract that phosphorus mm. from excessive uh, phosphorus from from river systems or lakes, oh, that's cool. um, you know, there is a potential there. And so there, there are small pilot programs that are taking place. I think there are a couple in Europe and, and there's been discussion about that, um, uh, here in the States as, as one potential. Another thing that we've seen in a couple of small pilot programs, again, is, um, um, bioreactors and in bioreactors are, um, think of like, an Olympic sized swimming pool and it's put in a sort of a natural swale where, where water on the fields are naturally coming down towards the river. And in this giant swimming pool are, um, activated charcoal in, in wood chips and, and things of that nature. And then it's, it's filled with this material and then it's covered with, with topsoil and then the water comes in and it naturally feeds into these bioreactors and then it's slowly released on the back end and that phosphorus gets removed um, from that water. And, and so, um, and, and it's shown, you know, potential. I mean, one is, one is cost and then the other is how often does that material need to be replenished and replaced? And so there, there are definitely pilot programs that are going on um, that are, are, are doing that and, and um, on the, in the Shenandoah Valley. And, you know, I, I think that, that that is one way. There currently is a, uh, a subsidy that exists to ship um, poultry litter and cattle manure out of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. But that subsidy, quite honestly, is very small. It's like $15 a ton. And given the cost of fuel and everything else, it's of little to no, you know, interest on the on the part of the farmers to move that material mm -hmm. because they're going to spend far more than fifteen dollars to get that material out of the out of the Chesapeake watershed. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you know, could could it be done on a on a larger scale and you get some economies of scale and putting it on freight cars and heading it out to Iowa for the cornfields where there's an agronomic oh, yeah. need for it. If you there's know? money involved, like if you can make a buck, like that's fascinating to me. Like yeah. where I, I'm thinking like the front Royal dam area, you put a, it's a water treatment facility there, but specifically to extract what you want from it, put it back in the water. Right. And all of a sudden we found a way to make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. Somebody's making a buck off of that and we're cleaning up our water system. Like right. that's a very ingenious thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there, there are, um, I mean, there are a number of pilot programs and people are sort of looking at that, but how do you, it's one thing to do it in a laboratory setting. It's another thing to be able to construct it on a, on a massive scale. I mm -hmm. mean, um, it, you know, I've been contacted probably three or four times in the past seven years about people wanting to come in with like algal skimmers and, and skim, you know, algae out of the, the river system. And it's great if there is a, you know, specially built pond or lake and you have 
uniform levels and uniform um, depth and width, and they could they could just get the skimmer to come through and 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 peel all this off. But you're not going to be able to do that in the rocky bottom that exists on the on on the Shenandoah and on the North Fork. But I mean, people are interested in and in looking and exploring at options. Is there um, anything that'll that will eat that algae? Yeah, I mean, there there, there is. Um, you know, they're they're looking at sort of bacteria uh, okay. that will, in fact, consume. At, and and then also, I mean, you're looking at, um, you know, some of the energy companies are investing money to look at hmm. um, bacteria that's eating algae and that can take that and convert it into an energy source. But I'm not aware of anything that's taking place in the Shenandoah at, at that level. I think that to do something like that, you would need to be looking at algal blooms occurring and um, and large either river systems or coastal systems to to be able to to pull some of that out. Because I know Odenkirk, when we had him on and we talked about Lake Anna and the reason like the SAV is so important is because like one reason that there are blooms that he suspects is when you have no vegetation in the lake at all, it will happen. And I feel like with the Shenandoah, it's a little different. It's a chicken or the egg thing that because of the pesticides and, and the certain stuff that got in there, it killed the grass and therefore you lost that natural filtration system. So the only way you probably could get the grass back is to then make the water better to have the grass back. So that's a weird chicken yeah. or the egg and then, thing. And then also on an individual seasonal to seasonal um, standpoint is that if, if you have a, a relative mild spring, and um, in you, you can have higher water, but if there's not that much sediment in the water, it allows that sunlight to hit the river bottom, and that allows that subaquatic vegetation to start growing. And it, you know, subaquatic vegetation grasses they, they have a root system. Algal systems do not have, um, you know, classic root systems, and so that grass starts growing, it starts filtering out that particulate, which allows more sunlight to hit the river bottom, which allows more grass to grow. And so it sort of becomes a, a repeating cycle. But if you get high dirty water in the, um, in the spring that prevents the subaquatic vegetation from really taking hold, um, you know, you can have uh, algal blooms throughout the year. And the other thing that's concerned too, is that, I mean, I, have pictures and we've been out. I mean, like we had algal blooms going on and, and filamentous algae. We were out on the river on, in the Cairo area on the South Fork last January and February. And there was algae, you know, growing on the river bottom in January and February. Water temp is 30, 4 degrees. Hmm. I mean, it, that should not be growing there at that time of year. And in fact, it was there. And so that's why we were sort of collectively holding our breath of like, oh, crap, is this going to be a really bad um, algal year for 2022? And it turned out not to be as as bad as the years past. What are your thoughts on like the low water levels? Because a lot of the old timers I've talked to, and I could just even see it in my time, where, and granted, we'll get those rains, we'll get a high water level event, but it's like no time at all is like below normal again. It just seems overall the volume of water, the amount of water in our river system is less than it's ever been. And has that contributed to the amount of uh, houses and, and manufacturing and, and need for water in a given area, in a given town? Is that, do you see that as being a concern in, in your time oh, in yeah. the history of the river? Yeah, I, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real concern. And I think that could um, contribute to some of these blooms yeah. too. Yeah, you got yeah. less water. That water, the good water flow is going to wash a lot of that out. You know, it's going to keep it. You're going to get more stagnant water, you know, probably in areas too. But uh, it just seems to me, and that's also, you know, Jeff brought up that too. I've always thought about, you know, the the spawn class and a high water obviously would wash that out. But they talked about, and you, you mentioned also, a really low water level too is not good for a spawn. So you almost have to have just about. Right. And then increased water temperatures too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's uh, that's a problem. Yeah. You, I mean, for low water, I mean, when you look at um, the 2021 season, um, especially over in the North Fork of the Shenandoah, if, if you were to graph that, and I could send you a copy of the graph from essentially from That'd April, be great, actually. Yeah, April through September, um, the Strasbourg gauge has been in existence, I think, for 93 years. And you had water levels below the 93 year average. Wow. For the entirety of the season, which is just like a perfect for for heavy, you know, for heavy algal blooms or harmful algal blooms to occur. You, you need like three things. You need warm water temperatures with with good daylight and everything. You need lots of nutrients, which is the poultry litter and the cattle manure and, and nitrogen and phosphorus. And then you need 
some residency time where that water is sort of going slowly through the system and it really allows those nutrients and the algal bloom hmm. to start growing. And so on the North Fork of the Shenandoah, you had all three of those things. Yeah. And, and so that algal bloom, um, you know, when it was issued, you know, and it got expanded to 52 and a half miles, it's like, oh my God. And then it wasn't until the beginning of September when Hurricane Ida came screaming up the valley. And in in some respects, we dodged a bullet because it went screaming up the valley in the span of like 24, 36 hours. And it wasn't until it hit Philadelphia in New York where Ida stalled and caused massive um, you know, flooding damage in the in in their cities up there, but you saw the Strasburg River gauge was hovering around 100 cfs, 125 cfs, nothing, like eight bathtubs of water, um, and and the Strasburg gauge went from 125 cfs to 9,000 cfs in the span of 36 hours because of just the volume of water that dropped. And, and when you're looking at a lot of the research on climate change and, and these warmer temperatures, you know, is it manifesting itself in the mid Atlantic and in the Chesapeake area with, with low water conditions in the summer? So you have a, a wet spring, which is bad for smallmouth. I mean, like a high water, wet spring, bad for smallmouth. And then you have prolonged low water conditions for, August and September and, and to allow all this algae to really sort of take root. And then it's punctuated by these extreme storm events where you see Strasbourg go from 125 to 9,000 CFS and, and, and just blow all of that algal mass out of the river system right. and a lot of the fish too, and, you know, down into the Potomac. Sure. Um, so it's, yeah, but I'm, I'm very concerned about, about low water. Um, and, and, you know, part of it is, um, uh, you know, population growth. I mean, that is a concern. Um, but it is when you look at some of the research, even though the population is expanding, you're seeing improvements in um, manufacturing operations where they're not using as much water. You're seeing um, improvements in pipes and infrastructure. So there's not as much leakage and wastage that's going on, but nonetheless, that, that is a concern. Um, what, um, so what can citizens, users, uh, people in our area, what can they do? What can we do to help this resource, to help Shenandoah river keepers, uh -huh. um, to, because it's obvious from your stories, you guys are mm -hmm. doing a lot of great things behind the scenes. Um, and we appreciate that. Uh, but what more can we do uh, as users to help yeah, this resource? I help mean, um, from a from a purely selfish standpoint, you could become members of the Potomac mm -hmm. River Keeper Network or become members of the Shenandoah. So I'm going to do that tonight. I've done that before it, in the past. I've it, been a member, but I haven't renewed. So, so go online, yeah, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, you go online and you front page, there'll be a donate button or a you know join button you could you could do that it's important to us for our organization to continue to survive but also standing i was talking about um before um the other thing that you can do it's one thing to sit amongst your fishing friends and have a beer and and bitch and moan and and complain about the situation of the resource right. um squeaky wheel gets the grease you need to talk to your legislators you need to you need to talk to your state legislators or state senators and say, hey, I'm really concerned about the health of the river. There are these algal blooms and my grandfather, and my dad. And when I was a kid, we, we see these all the time and th these are not natural. What are you doing to protect the river? And 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 if they are good elected officials, they're going to, you know, initially they may think, I don't know, what do I need to be doing? And but it, it needs to be on their radar. And the only way it gets on the radar is to have people voice their concern about it. And so when you attend um, candidate debates or if you're going to write a letter, voice your concern. I'm concerned about the health of the river system. I'm concerned about protecting it for future generations. Um, and, you know, I, I think that we need to be doing more to protect the river. Um, our livelihood, I mean, the unique culture and the and what makes the Shenandoah Valley so cool is the river. And, 
And if we lose that, we really lose our cultural identity and, and we can't take it for granted. We need to protect it. Um, and so I, you know, I encourage everybody to, to, you know, I ask candidates, if I, if I'm at a, you know, a candidate forum or whatever, excuse me, what are you doing to protect the river? How are you going to be doing this? What about future generations? You can do that. Another thing that you can do is, um, there's an app. I mean, we're really seeing the, um, the, uh, growth of technology and protecting the river. Um, I mean, just since I've been here, I mean, we've, you know, we use a drone in our arsenal now that we, that, that we didn't have. We're using, we're, we're ourselves doing, uh, water quality testing and monitoring for anatoxin A and microcystins that the toxins because DQ didn't have the funding for it. So we went and got funding and, and, and we're out there, um, testing water samples. Um, but then another thing is, um, uh, there's a, a water, there's an app called on your smartphone called water reporter, and you can download the water reporter and you got it on your smartphone. And, um, the way it works is you're going down the river and you're fishing with your friends or your family. And all of a sudden you see a big algal mat and it's like, oh my God, that's ugly. That's, that shouldn't be there. And you can just reach over and you can pick up your phone, click on the water reporter app. You take a photo. If you want to write a blurb, you can say, I was floating on Saturday and we saw this and it, it went for two miles or, you know, whatever, you know, additional information you need and you hit send and it goes to either me, if it occurred on the Shenandoah, or will go to the other keeper responsible for that, for that area. And it alerts us because it will automatically geolocate where the photo was taken. And so then on, you know, on Monday, whenever we get back, you know, it's like, oh, wow, this is going on. Let's go check this out. And so it expands our eyes and ears by being out there by the use of that app. And then, guys, again, like always, a link in the episode description to everything that was talked about today, the app where you can sign up to be Riverkeeper. That'll all be in the episode description, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or iHeartRadio. Uh, please, you know, give a follow. Please try to become a member because, you know, we need to get all of our voices collectively. You know, that's the one thing I loved about Toronto Limited, how they can, like, they're all unified in their goal. And, you know, our mission here at Fishing the DMV, you know, is conservation education, a little bit of entertainment. And it's about unifying all these tribes, whether you're your tribe, you know, trout fishing, small mouth like we all need the waterways that, that are around this area to be better because it helps everyone right. it really does uh, mark i mean i think i can't thank you enough for coming on the show i really appreciate it jared is there anything else that we need to need, no need to touch i think on? that's good I, one quick thing too like if uh, like sores on a fish if you same type of thing you take a picture of lesions yeah. and send that to i mean it might not be anything but you you need that data you need that information i mean i think also we're the eyes you're only one person. You only have a small group of people that are out there. So you're going to rely on uh, us out there and yeah. what we see and where we see it to collect that information. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's where the Water Reporter app also helps of just you know, snapping a quick photo of that. You know, some lesions, you know, can occur naturally, especially during the spawn and the stress of the spine. It's one thing. But if you're seeing them throughout the year, it's, um, you know, that's something else of concern. And then often, too, the use of the Water Reporter app, it often you know, five people submit a, um, you know, a couple of photos all in the same general right. area. Then you're wow. Something's going on. Something, There's some yeah. bacteria going on here. Mm -hmm. And so, yep. Lesions, absolutely a legitimate concern. And then the other thing is just when, you know, when, when you're with your friends and things like that, to sort of talk about these same issues and also to protect their, the resource. And I know people, you know, especially new anglers, um, that are out and, um, they're just, you know, learning how to fish and it's great is to, um, you know, more seasoned anglers to take time to try to educate new folks about um, the proper way to handle fish. And if, if you do catch, you're fortunate enough to catch a large fish, you know, just don't, you know, just have it hang vertically and, and you know, try to support the fish on a horizontal plane just to let those fish survive. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I tell people to um, be very quick about, you know, taking photographs and, and release the fish quickly and safely and, you know, try to do things that you sort of learn over time and you think everybody knows how to do, but if someone's just getting into the game, um, you may, may not be as aware of it. And so I, I think that all of us, um, need to play the role of educator with all of our friends and family members that are just getting into it. And, and to also encourage, um, taking young kids out and to enjoy the, the resource because, um, 
you, you know, lots of kids are just staying at home and they're playing their video games and, and, um, unless they fall in love with the river, they're not, you know, in 10 years, they're not going to be really that concerned about protecting it. Yeah. So well, Mark, again, we appreciate it. And I think the relationships that we build too, and I think I'm anxious to hear after 2023 meeting, uh, with those different organizations, we'll have to reconnect with them yeah, and maybe have you back on yeah. and just find out how that went. And I mean, I learned a lot. We always talk about too. I always learned something. Every time we come always, on we here always learn something and uh, you've educated us and, and some good information and hopefully our viewers feel the same way and realize that there's a lot of good things going on. Uh, and like you said, we can oftentimes look at all the negative and the bad, uh, but just knowing that there's somebody out there uh, watching over the resource and having oversight of these different organizations and stuff and having the ability to go out and sue people that are that are trying to get away with things or doing right. wrong. Um, again, we just, we can't thank you enough. So we appreciate you. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. Enjoyed it. You're, hey, you're very welcome. You're welcome on the show anytime. Again, guys, please like and subscribe to the channel. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcast. Again, we are Fishing the DMV. We are the only podcast in the greater D.C. area that serves D.C. and the surrounding states. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.